Okay, and I think I'm also recording, so you will be able to have it. So let's go Perfect. to the first question, uh, which is, uh, uh, tell me about how you do the status reporting. So here you will need to mention uh, the status reporting is an important process. We, for this, for example, if you're doing the, the status reporting for Windows 10 project, then you will say uh, the status reporting for this project was uh, being done on a weekly basis. Uh, every Monday morning, we used to have a steering committee meeting in which the okay. status of the project used to get discussed. Uh, yeah. In order to have the, uh, in order to have the status uh, reporting discussed in that meeting, uh, it was my job to have everything re ready by end of day Thursday um, so that my so that uh, I could have so end of day Thursday I used to have a meeting with my program manager who used to review the status reporting uh, deck that I used to create and then we used to review it Thursday evening and there used to be some yeah. edits and then uh, on Friday afternoon we used to send out the deck to all the steering committee members and yeah. uh, so that allowing them or the entire weekend and half a day of Friday to go through the entire deck, and then this deck was usually discussed in on Monday morning. Um, so, so basically, uh, you're saying the status report was uh, done by Thursday night. Um, yeah, and then we sent it out on what day again? Uh, we sent it out on, on Friday noon. Friday noon, okay. And then it yeah. gets reviewed by Monday. And it is discussed in a meeting, uh, the steering committee, Meeting with a lot of other lot of people who participate, like all the yep. VPs and senior management team, they participate in that meeting. So in that meeting, that meeting takes place on Monday morning. So yep. it allows people uh, half a day of Friday and the entire weekend to go through that PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so okay. that it gives them enough time to digest all the information which is in that PowerPoint. And then Monday, when we meet with them, then they can ask all the questions. So usually it is a common practice that if you have, if you are running a meeting, if you are chairing a meeting, you do not send that send any material which is to be sent to that, which is to be discussed in that meeting just before that meeting. A lot of people do that. I have myself done that a few times. That just before the start of the meeting, I send out material and then um, abruptly we go into that material and start talking about it. So, but that is not uh, advisable. A better practice is to maybe at least a day or two before you send all the material that needs to be discussed, that will be discussed in that meeting, and give people one or two days to go through that information, and some of those people may get back to you over email, et cetera, and ask some questions, um, and so on. Uh, so it's it's a good practice, especially when you yeah. are talking to executives, to give them at least a day or two to digest all the information that you're going to discuss with them. So that's exactly what right. we used to do uh, from for the status reporting perspective. Uh, by Thursday evening, I finalize my DAC. On 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 Thursday evening, uh, I discuss the DAC with the program manager. Uh, and another half a day, Friday morning till Friday noon. That's another four or five hours for me to make any changes. Friday noon, we send it out to the people, uh, all the executive steering committee members, and Monday we discuss it. Now, in order to prepare everything by Thursday evening, uh, there are quite a few things that need to be done before Thursday. So if I rewind, uh, what I could say is I, because I am dependent on a lot of inputs from various project team members. So what I tell them that, hey, I need your inputs by end of day Wednesday. So for example, if it is a program status report, in order to have a program status report, I need inputs from every project. Oh, let's, let's not confuse that. So let's say, uh, so by Wednesday evening, I need inputs from my project team members, and those team members could be business analysts, the person who is holding the pen on the project schedule, the person who has identified any risks or issues, 
so all those inputs I gather from yeah. them um, and yeah. but then tell them, hey, so what I do is on Wednesday morning, I send out a note to all the project team members and telling them, hey, well, I need all your inputs by end of day today. Uh, and then during the day, mm, they all send their inputs, uh, whatever they want to include in the status reporting. Then gotcha. when I'm leaving home on Wednesday evening, uh, by that time I have received all the inputs. So first thing that I do when I come to the office on Thursday morning, I start assembling all that information because it takes me one full day to prepare that PowerPoint presentation, which is basically the status report. So it gives me seven, eight hours. What was that? Sorry. I have a question. So you're telling us like the timeline of how a status report is made, but um, yes. you're saying that a status report is made with like a PowerPoint. It's just a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, you can say that. Yeah, it can be an Excel document. It can be a Word document. It can be a PowerPoint document. So yes, uh, you you can. If they ask you what format it was, you can you can pick any. You can say it used to be an Excel document, for example. Or it could be a PowerPoint document. Okay. Okay. So this is the process that you used to follow uh, in for creating the service. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, if they can poke some holes in it, they can ask you some more detailed questions on it. For example, uh, what did you use to include in the status report? So if they ask you, then your answer will be yes. It used to be the standard. Uh, content, for example, the overall summary, uh, if the project status is red, green, or yellow, what is the return to green plan, um, and uh, some of the notable issues, uh, some of the key risks, what is the action plan for mitigating those risks, uh, a financial summary as to how much money the project has spent so far, and what is the ESC, the estimated completion, uh, and um, uh, and uh, and the timeline as to what are some of the key activities that have, we have done this week and what are some of the key activities that we are going to do uh, over the next few weeks and if there is any uh, problem or any issue with any of those timelines. So those are some of the usual contents which are discussed in almost every status report. Uh, so that, uh, now they cannot Really, really, they cannot ask you anything further than this on a status reporting. Uh, they cannot ask you, give me an example of an issue. Yeah, no. So th that's, that's not what they can ask. So I think that concludes almost, if you know this much stuff, what I just explained to you about the status report during the last five minutes, I think you are good from almost okay. every uh, angle about the status report. So now I will move to the next uh, topic, which will be, how did you use to track the financials? So financials, uh, you can tell them the process used to be fairly straightforward. What I used to do is uh, towards the end of the month, like on the 23rd, for example, this is July. So on 25th or 26th of July, I start reporting, I start running some reports. I run a report from Clarity. I run a report from General Ledger and start eyeballing, start looking at uh, how, my, how what are the transactions that have taken place during the current month. For example, the resource report that I run from Clarity, I look at how much time the pro how much time different people have charged to my project and is it in line with my forecast or not. A lot of times it happens is I was expecting a business analyst to charge 100 hours to my project and when I look at Clarity, I see he has charged only 20 hours to my project. So I usually I reach out to him and say, hey, Mr. Business Analyst, uh, is there something missing? Uh, did you forget to enter your time in Clarity? Or did you actually work on the 20 hours on my project during this month? Or something else has happened? Uh, so just giving them that wake-up call and telling them to just make sure that they have uh, entered the right amount of time in the system, in Clarity, um, that used to 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 help um, remove a lot of issues because sometimes if I do not do this step, then what happens is 
the month is closed, like on 31st of July, 5 o'clock or 12 o'clock at night, the month is closed, which means that Clarity and GL, both of these systems, will not accept any new transactions. So on 1st of August, for example, somebody says, oops, I forgot to charge my time to the project. Too bad, so sad, because the month is closed, you cannot go back in time and enter all that time to the, to the project. Yes, there is a way around it, but that's a very complicated, cumbersome way. You have to go talk to IT and open it up again and uh, allow people to charge this time to the project. However, on 31st of August, or sorry, on 31st of July, by noon, if somebody realizes, oh, I, I forgot to enter my time this week or this month, they can still, they can conveniently do that. So by 31st of July, when the month is closed, which means when the clock strikes midnight on 31st of July, the month gets closed. You cannot go back to the month of July and make any changes to whatever has been entered in the month, neither in clarity nor in the general ledger. So that's why it is important that a few days before the month is about to complete, you look at and see how what what are how do the numbers look like how much time people have charged to the project so far is it in line with the with the forecast or not and then if you see if you realize any issues then you uh, then you fix them beforehand okay so that's what you'll say on 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 the last few days a few days before the end of the month I run those reports and look for any anomalies any uh, transactions which do not make sense, for example, if some of the resources have not charged time to the project, or for example, if there is a big invoice showing in my general ledger, uh, and I can realize, oh, no, 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 this is not my invoice, somebody else's invoice has been charged to my project, we need to remove it as soon as possible. So you can make all those uh, fixes before the end of the month. So that's what I do. And then when the month is closed, I download the final report. Uh, from Clarity as well as the general ledger. There are certain templates uh, which I populate, which give people, uh, which we basically call a tracker, uh, where I track my monthly information. Uh, and on the tracker, I write down as to resource by resource, how much time everybody has um, done on the project. I compare it against the forecast. I do some variance analysis as to how much uh, time, how, how much money or how much time was supposed to be spent on a line item. And a line item means, for example, uh, hardware, for example, software, for example, uh, Peter had to spend how much, five hours on this project this month, he spent four hours, so one hour is a variance. So, so I, I populate those templates, do a variance analysis, investigate those variances by reaching out to people and run some com and write down some commentaries and that's, that's one of the key activities that I do from a financial perspective so this is so by end of business, end of day 1 or end of day 2 uh, which is usually called a business day 1 or business day 2 because if first of august for example if it falls on a saturday you will not be working on a saturday so you will actually start working on not on saturday which is first of august not on Sunday, which is 2nd of August, you will start working on 3rd of August. So 3rd of August is the business day 1. 4th of August is business day 2. I'm just making it, I'm just pretending that 1st of August was a Saturday. Um, it may not be, but... Uh, so uh, that's, uh, so by business day 1 or end of business day 2, all my actuals have been finalized, my, invest, my variance analysis has been completed, then, uh, and my, some of my key templates have been populated, then what I do is I next step for me is to do a forecast for the rest of the life of the project, which is called EAC, estimated completion. So I reach out to different people in the organization and try to get their estimates. For example, there is a training manager. He had said at the beginning of the project that he's in $1 million to spend on training, and so far he has already spent two hundred thousand dollars so I would reach out to him and say hey Robert you spent two hundred thousand dollars already you had said uh, at the beginning of the project that you will need to spend one million dollars so are you still good and will you be able to complete all that 
training by spending $800,000 more so that your overall spend is $1 million? Or will you need more money or less money? And he could say, no, I will need more money. Uh, or he will say, uh, I, was, I need to do some adjustments. I was thinking that I will do a lot of training in the month of August. But during the month of August, I will not be able to do that because uh, some of the material is not ready or the team members are not ready, so I will do all that activity in September or in October. So he may adjust some of the timing of some of the expenses or he may adjust the overall expenditure, say instead of $1 million, I may need to spend $1.1 or $1.2 million or $900,000 or whatever the amount may be. Uh, so I make all those adjustments as a PCO. I make all those adjustments in my tracker uh, and adjust it. And by end of business day five, I have all the uh, actuals finalized and I have my forecast finalized. And then I draw some comparisons against my overall uh, forecast. How does it compare against the business case? Uh, and uh, draw some comparisons against it. For example, my overall business case was for $20 million. My overall forecast, by the way, when we say forecast, usually we mean the stuff which needs to be spent in the future. But uh, when we talk about the overall project forecast, it includes uh, whatever has been spent so far and whatever is going to be spent for the remaining life of the project. So, for example, if the business case said that $20 million is needed for this project, and now your latest greatest forecast says uh, you will need $21 million altogether, so there is a gap of $1 million, and then I explain that gap of $1 million that we will need $1 million extra because of a PCR, which was done uh, where we added some additional scope to the project. Uh, so those kind of comparisons I draw, and then on business day five or six, I prepare a few slides uh, of PowerPoint presentation, put all these actuals and forecasts and other commentaries there on the PowerPoint. I also identify some for issues which may be uh, um, impacting the uh, the overall uh, financial results of the project. Uh, um, and then I summarize all this information and this four or five slide deck is usually included in the steering committee status report deck uh, once a month. So a status reporting deck, for example, is usually a 10 slides deck, for example. So at the beginning of the month, whenever the final, whenever the final results have been, have been finalized, in the week following that, uh, one of the topics, one of the agenda items in the steering committee meeting will be to review the financials of, for the month. So, for example, a steering committee meeting is taking place on a Monday, which is, I'm just making it up, on, say, 10th of August, which is a Monday, for example. Uh, so in that 10th of August meeting, uh, the actual results for the month of July will be discussed. So the program manager or you will present to the steering committee meeting that during the month of July, we spent $900,000, our forecast was this much, our business case was this much, we underspent or overspent, this was the reason, and for the overall project, we are expecting to do, we are expecting to spend this much money. So all those financials, those are discussed with the steering committee members once a month. So the steering committee meeting takes place four times in a month. Only once a month, the financials are discussed because there is no point discussing the same financials again and again uh, four times in a month. So only once those are discussed, uh, because the financials go by a monthly cycle usually. Almost always they go by a monthly cycle. So that's why, you know, like you, you may have heard the term month end. So the month end basically that's, that's how the financial people, the accounting people, uh, they close the month at the end of the month and then they, they discuss the results with the, with, the people, with the senior executives once a month. So this pretty much covers your entire financial process. Let me just think about if they can ask any, any questions in this. Um, 
I have a question. You said tracker. Is that like a simu simu uh, simulation, like a simulating software? No, like tracker is yeah, Apple. That's a good question. A tracker is just a normal Excel spreadsheet. Nothing oh. fancy. Yeah. And maybe okay. I will show you a tracker on. I'll I will probably bring some documents from the office and I will probably try to show you an actual tracker. It's a very very okay. simple Excel document. Just like the way a few weeks ago we. Uh, like the, the like a resource plan that we were creating a few weeks ago, where we have columns by columns, the Jan, Feb, March, April, May, uh, June, July. That's exactly how a tracker looks like. You have one column for the month, uh, for each month, and then you have an overall how much total money is going to be spent this year and so on. Okay. Okay. Just to make it sound really more complicated, in an interview, you can also throw in that I also look at some of the capitalization amounts that are booked during the month and draw those summaries. But if you're not very comfortable talking about uh, capitalization, do not bring it up. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, if it is a financial, but tomorrow's interview, Friday's interview is not about financials. I mean, this level of detail for financials will be more than, uh, more than enough. Uh, there okay. may be some roles in some future interviews which will be very heavy, which could be very heavy on financials, and for that we will we will go one step deeper and talk about capitalization, et cetera, also. But uh, okay. for, for Friday's interview, this is more than enough information. Okay? okay. So uh, third step, third question that they could ask you, okay, tell me about um, what are uh, some of the, uh, how do you create a schedule? Uh, so you can say, for example, for with this Windows 10 project, it was a big program, so it had five small five projects underneath it. Every project had their own power, uh, had their own project schedule, uh, which was created in my, or Microsoft Project. So what I do, used to do, I used to work with number one, I used to work with every single project manager to create their respective project schedule in Microsoft Project. Uh, for example, the application remediation, that was a stream, that was a project of its own. So I used to sit with the project manager who was responsible for application remediation uh, and used to work with him in terms of what are some of the key activities, some key milestones, key tasks, their durations, adjusting their durations every week. So every week I used to refresh uh, the project uh, schedule for application remediation. Similarly, I used to do the same exercise for the hardware replacement uh, project. Similarly, the same exercise I used to do for um, for the for the infrastructure build or network build uh, project. So I used to repeat this exercise for all those five different projects. Then, once all the project individual project schedules were up to date then I used to integrate all of it. I used to create a separate file where I used to copy paste all this information and then uh, integrate uh, all of the, and create a, a integrated program uh, schedule. So that is the exercise that I used to do on a weekly basis. So uh, every week, uh, so just for me to repeat, so every week, uh, let's say end of day Thursday, uh, the individual project schedule used to be refreshed. Uh, any new activities which need to be uh, um, which needs to be included used to be included. And then, um, if any activities were running late, uh, then those activities were uh, the timelines of those activities were adjusted. Um, and um, I also used to create a report which was called a week over week report, uh, which used to basically explain if some activity had to be completed by the 1st of August, and now the new schedule says that it will be completed on 15th of August, then what is causing that two weeks long delay, and then explain that as well. So, uh, so the work used to take place at two levels. One is at a project level, and then secondly, uh, at a program level. And the program level work was just a compilation of all the individual project schedules and creating an integrated project schedule. And when I used to do that, uh, there were used to be certain dependencies among 
between different projects. Uh, for example, application remediation needs to be completed first before we can start doing any migration activities. Um, so, um, so th those those kind of things, those dependencies used to be then linked, and all of this was being was was used to be done using Microsoft Project. So that's that is almost. Could you also all say resources? We also say what? Sorry. Resources. Or uh, res no no I, I yeah okay so. Yes, that is another step that you could mention that for each activity, uh, the resources who will be working on that project, those also used to be included and, but do not go into that level of detail. Probably, yeah, if they ask you, they can. Uh, they can, you, you can mention that all the resources who will be working on certain activities, they also used to be identified. For example, last week I had said that uh, Bob will be working on this activity, and this week probably Bob is no more in the organization that I will say, okay, you know what, Bob will be working on this activity, and Peter will be working on this activity. Uh, so those kind of uh, things also used to be included in the project schedule. Um, yeah, so uh, that will take care of the project schedule. So the next topic I would say will be uh, they can ask you, okay, tell me about what kind of, and I think for tomorrow's interview, that's not likely. So I will probably skip that question, like unless if they are really using clarity, which most probably I think they are not. Uh, otherwise, if they were, uh, then they could ask, okay, tell me about how do you, do you use to use clarity. But really, I don't think they will be. But anyways, I will spend probably a minute or two. If they ask you how did you use to use uh, clarity, you can say I used to use clarity for a lot of things. For example, uh, for tracking the time which every single resource is, is working on the project that I used to use clarity on. Clarity also used to be the book of records. Book of record, that's a commonly used term, is the book of record, B-O-R. Uh, for the, for storing any risks or issues, so every project manager used to store their risks or issues on in Clarity, um, and uh, status reporting also for the individual project used to also used to be generated from Clarity, and uh, so status reporting, risks or issues, um, and uh, financials used to be tracked on Clarity, and so on. So those are some of the key activities. Uh, I think if you just mention that, that should be enough. You do not need to, I don't think this, they will bring up this topic in too much detail uh, in tomorrow, in Friday's interview. Okay. Uh, then they can, now can you just remind me what, what other questions did I mention at the beginning of the call? So we talked about scheduling, we talked about status reporting, we talked about financial tracking, we talked a little bit about clarity. Um, um, you said like what processes did you improve on? What process did you improve on? All right, okay. So for example, you can say, uh, yes, I improved a bunch of different processes. For example, there used to be a process that the uh, project used to receive different invoices from multiple vendors who had worked on this project. Um, for example, Microsoft used to send us an invoice. IBM used to send us invoices. Cisco used to be sending us invoices. Uh, smaller vendors, they also used to be sending us invoices. And what used to happen, is that uh, those invoices used to go to different individuals in the project team. Some companies used to send their invoices through email. Some companies used to send their invoices in a conventional envelope uh, through Canada Post. And that envelope sometimes used to land on my desk, sometimes used to land on somebody else's desk. And a lot of times those invoices used to get lost and so on. And then once they used to get lost, then people, then those invoices did not usually get paid. The vendors used to get upset, or they used to impose penalties on us. So that was a fairly broken process. And what I did is I uh, I first documented that process. That what is the current state? Uh, how we are receiving all the different invoices? The current state is a fancy word. It's a simple English language, but. Uh, Current state is a ter terminology which is usually used. So there are two terminologies which are used uh, when it comes to process mapping. One is the current state or as is state, 
And then the second one is to be a state. So current state is how all the invoices are being processed right now. For example, one of the processes that they, uh, one of the ways it is, it comes through email, it comes to the desks of different people, uh, or sometimes uh, we need to download those invoices from the website of the vendor or something like that. It could be there, there are multiple different ways how the invoices are sent to us in today's world, in current state. And then the future state uh, is how do we ideally want all the invoices to get paid? So you say I documented the current state and I also created another process map using Visio as to ideally how this needs to be paid. So ideally it was, for example, there will be only one person who will be the custodian of all the invoices, all the vendors, they were informed and whenever they are sending, uh, the invoices, they will be sending it to gazanfer.kreshi at td.com, and they will not be sending it to other people. Uh, so this, these instructions used to be very clearly provided to all the vendors. So then Gazanfer is, receives all the invoices related to this project. Um, and then uh, and the next thing was, uh, for example, I, I, on a weekly basis, I used to look at all the invoices that need to be paid. I used to compare it against the statements of work, for example, and I just check all the invoices. Uh, and I documented all this process that all these, these steps need to be included in the payment of those invoices. The first number one step is that all the invoices need to be sent to a central centralized person or location. Number two is they need to be checked for accuracy that the vendor has invoiced us all the uh, work is, is it, has it actually performed? Is it actually all the rates are correct? All the number of hours that they are billing us, are they correct or not? So that is for accuracy. The third thing which was there to get those approvals, like if it's a million dollar invoice, then it needs to be approved by the vice president. If it is a $10,000 invoice, maybe a manager can approve. So all those approvals need to be obtained. Uh, and then fourth thing is, then once all those approvals are obtained, then the invoice is sent to the accounting department for payment, and then the accounting department writes a check or does a wire transfer to the vendor's, in, to the vendor's account. So I documented all this. I drew a, uh, micro, a, a chart, a, a, a diagram in my, using Microsoft Visio. I also provided some uh, explanation to this entire process, and that's how I documented it. Um, and then by this, I also, I not only, this was, you can use this as an example of documenting a process, and then you can also use it as an example of how I improve the process. For example, you can say the example that I was telling you that earlier the process was that the invoices were going to five different locations, now I, the process improvement that I brought is I told the instructions were issued to all the vendors that all the invoices need to be sent to gazanfor.crashy at cd.com, and uh, that's how the entire process was improved. And that's how we were able to, um, to reduce misplaced invoices and we were able to reduce the penalties that the vendors were imposing on us. So these five, Six quick, so okay, so this this is also so this is the example of documentation and um, uh, process improvement. What else did I? What other question did I mention at the beginning of the call? Um, another question you mentioned was one second. Uh, what did you? Yeah, no, that was it. Basically, what did you document? Yes, okay, so the documentation we covered that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, all right. right. So can we say the same thing? Like I feel like if he goes first and he yeah. doesn't, then I do. All right. That's Hello? a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because so, on today's recorder, he said um, there's only two people. I I don't know if that's true. He said it was only two people for the project coordinator uh, role that they're interviewing uh, interviewing on Friday. Oh, and my they're interview Yeah. And oh, really? Right? Yeah. <laughs> then those two people are you, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, my. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, so you could come up with a slightly different uh, example could be for documenting the, pro doc 
for documentation, you could also say that um, documenting the status reporting process. For example, these report, the, the entire process that I explained, like all of these processes that I explained, for example, the financial tracking process, the uh, scheduling process, the status reporting process, all of these can be documented in this absolutely the same way. Uh, for example, you could say earlier the status reporting process was a little broken, people did not use to send their inputs on time, uh, and uh, we used to struggle uh, finalizing the status report by end of day Friday. That's why, and then sometimes I had to work over the weekend finalizing it, and sometimes the status report used to be sent out Monday morning or just before the meeting was about to start. Uh, and that was not a good process. So by I introduced all those improvements that I told people, hey, I need your inputs by end of the event. If you do not send me your inputs, I'm sending you to jail or uh, something along those lines. So I made sure that everybody was sending their inputs. And you can also say that I brought up that kind of a thing in the team meetings, a, a hall of, hall of, what do you call, hall of fame, wall of shame or whatever, like anybody who's, who did not submit their uh, status, uh, who did not submit their inputs by end of day Wednesday, I used to bring up, or my program manager used to bring up their names in the team meeting so that they feel a little guilty and ashamed that they are the latecomers or they are the people who did not do their job. And then next week, they those people started submitting. So it took a few weeks for the, to introduce that discipline among the team members so that they provide all their inputs by end of day Wednesday. And that is also an example of uh, how you, you can say that I documented this process and I improved this process, the service reporting process. So that, that yeah. could be a good example. Similarly, you can use it for scheduling and similarly you can use it for financial tracking. So financial tracking, you can do the same thing on business day one, I do this, on business day two, I do this, on business day three, I do this, and so on. So there, I think there are new, like all the five, six different topics that we talked about, all of these can be documented and there is room to improve these processes because we have talked about all the different processes today, in fact, the financial tracking process, the scheduling process, the status supporting process, three key processes that we talked about. Then we talked also talk about the invoice payment process. So these three, four different processes, they can be documented and they can be improved. So in your interview tomorrow, you can pick up a status reporting, you can pick up uh, invoice thing, payment, and so on. So both will do, okay? Okay. Uh, I, so this is good, whatever I've been speaking for the last 45 minutes, so that is good. Now, a key thing is to understand it, which probably you would have understood maybe 60, 70% of it already. If nothing else, once you will go through the notes and maybe have some discussion among yourself, uh, you will understand it. But the key thing is to say it in an interview, what needs to be said first, what needs to be said second. So I think that's something that we will talk about tomorrow. We'll do a mock interview tomorrow, where we will go through all the questions that we went through yesterday, or day before yesterday, whenever it was the interview. Um, and plus these questions. Uh, so it will be jumbled up and some behavioral questions, for example, my questions that I will probably ask you tomorrow will be, okay, tell me, give me an example of how you resolve a conflict. Uh, and then the next question is, okay, tell me about your financial reporting process. How did you use to report the financial of a project? Okay. Um, okay. And then uh, the word documents that I, yeah, I think this, this pretty much, these five, six topics, these are usually the favorite topics of the, of the hiring method. I will throw in one more, one or two more questions, which is for example, uh, okay, tell me about uh, how do you convey bad news to these stakeholders? So, or before that, there is a very simple question that they ask, they can ask is, okay, tell me what is the difference between a risk and an issue. So risk, so this is a favorite question. It's a very academic question, but it is usually asked. I have heard it in a lot of interviews. Uh, the difference between a risk and an issue is 
risk is something which has not occurred yet, which has the probability of occurring, but it has not occurred yet. So that is the risk. Yeah. The issue is something which has already happened. Ongoing, yeah. Which is already ongoing, which has already happened, and so that is an issue. So that is the difference between a risk and an issue. Okay. Uh, another question that they could ask is, tell me about how do you convey a bad news to the stakeholder? So you cannot say, hey, I never had to convey anything, any ever, any bad news to the people. So you, so that's not a good answer. You will say that, hey, I hate. Uh, I have seen in my three, four years of uh, experience as a project control officer that. Um, uh, in fact, just remind me, uh, there was one more thing in your interview, and in fact, there was one more thing in your interview that you guys did not take care of. So just remind me at the, at the end of this call uh, okay. that I need to tell you. Um, okay, so, uh, so you'll say that uh, usually what I have learned in my three, four years of experience as a project control officer, uh, that uh, people, the executives, they do not like surprises. For example, they will not like that you go to them and one fine morning tell them, hey, uh, your project was supposed to spend $20 million and bad news that you will be needing another $5 million to complete your project. They do not want to hear those kind of surprises. Uh, so uh, the way I usually convey those bad news or, for example, this, so this could be one example of the bad news where you're telling your stakeholders uh, or your sponsors as to who uh, uh, that they will be needing more money. That is a bad news. Or another bad news could be that, hey, one of the key project managers has uh, left the team. He found a better job somewhere else, and he's, he's left, and he was an important resource for the a team, uh, so uh, bad news. So that's another example of the bad news. A third example of the bad news could be that we had to onboard a vendor, uh, but because our we did not, we were not able to obtain the approval. So the onboarding of that vendor will be delayed by four weeks. So these are all examples of bad news. You usually you will say that I usually do not go in a steering committee meeting and tell them those bad news. I have a mechanism, so this is the key line, I have a mechanism how I, every week, I identify those risks. For example, I will identify a risk that, hey, there is a likelihood that we will end up spending more money than we had thought. I'm not saying that we will definitely spend more money, but I'm giving you a heads up that there is a probability, there is a low probability, there is a low chance uh, that we may end up spending more money. Uh, next week when you go and say, hey, I'm telling you again, I told you last week, now I'm telling you there is a medium probability that we will end up spending more money than what we had thought. And then two, three weeks later, you will say, hey, guys, I'm telling you there is a very, very high probability, almost to the level of almost certain that we will need more money than what we had discussed in the business case. And then one, two weeks later, then you tell them, guys, as I have been telling you for the past four weeks that you will be needing more money, and yeah. here is the project change request, and here is what I actually need more money. So gradually, you have built uh, that context for uh, delivering that bad news to the stakeholders. Okay. Uh, similarly, uh, in the second example that I gave you, if there is a delay in the onboarding of a uh, vendor, for example, then you will tell them, hey, uh, you start giving them heads up, hey, it usually takes three months to onboard a vendor, and I, because this is summertime and a lot of executives, they are away, and we will not be able to obtain their approvals because they are on vacations. Uh, so I'm suspecting there may be the vendor onboarding may get delayed. And then next week again, you'll say, hey, I suspect highly that the vendor onboarding will get delayed and this will be, if it happens, then these could be the impact and implications. And then third week you go and tell them that, hey, this is vendor onboarding is very, very likely going to get delayed and so on. So gradually every week over a period of three, four weeks or over a period of even three, four months, you slowly, gradually communicate all those um, 
risks to the stake all those bad news to the stakeholders through this risk risk identification mechanism. And when you eventually tell them, hey guys, bad news, this has happened, at that time that risk becomes an issue. So when you say that, hey, I need more money, then that's an issue now because you are asking the uh, stakeholder or the steering committee member to, um, to, to uh, actually write a check, write an additional check of I don't know, two, five, two million or three million dollars to, to, to you or to your project. Okay, so that is the mechanism through which I communicate bad news. Now, another question that could come up is, uh, it cannot, I mean, it's, oh, it's one more thing is, okay, you document, you, you mentioned that you create all those different artifacts such as project charter or for business requirement document and so on. Uh, tell me, did you actually use to write it yourself or did you just participate in it? So you could, Say, so the answer to this will be, you can say some of the documents I, some of the artifacts I participated in creating them, and some of them I created myself. Uh, for example, business requirement document, I was not the one who was holding the pen to that document. The business analyst was holding that the pen, but I used to also review it. I also used to provide my inputs to that document. Uh, whereas another document, for example, Project Charter, I almost, I wrote it from beginning to end, and Project Charter, if you remember, uh, uh, even if you don't remember, Project Charter is basically, uh, why is a document, three, four pages document which says, why do we want to do this project? It is done at the almost the beginning, very, very beginning of the, of the project, uh, and it includes why do we want to do the project, how much money it will need, how much uh, time will it require, who will be the key resources, some very, very high level information that is given in the project charter. So you can say, hey, for, for this, I joined the project team when it was at the very beginning and I was the one who uh, almost all of the project charter I wrote myself. How did you write the project charter? I talked to a lot of people within the organization, gathered all those all that information as to created a high level project plan as to what are some of the key activities that we will need to do and uh, what resources we will need and so on. So basically it is just like coming up with a plan of a project, a feasibility study of a project or a business case of a project in two minutes uh, that will be a project charter. For example, if I ask you to, hey, can you, in by midnight tonight, can you give me a project charter for uh, for for constructing a 50-story condo building in Mississauga? Can you do that? So then you will just think in your head, uh, make maybe probably make a few phone calls to some of your builder friends and then come up with a two three pages, very very high level document that hey yes a 50-story condo building can be constructed in one year. Uh, it will cost approximately $10 million and it will require 50 different engineers and architects and labor, et cetera. And so that, that high level document, very, very high level document uh, is usually called project charter. So you can say, hey, I created that project charter uh, for this Windows 10 migration project, okay? Um, then, then you can also say that I also used to write, a, create a lot of those docs, so another, another Artifacts that I used to create was project PCR, which is the project change request. Every time there was a change in the project, for example, if uh, we say that hey, we will not be using computers from Dell, we will be using computers from HP or IBM. That's the project change request. If we say that uh, we uh, will uh, not migrate. We will complete this project not in two years, but we will need another two and a half, another half, six months to do this. That will be an example of the project change request. If we say that we will not be able to complete this project in $20 million, but we will need another $2 million, that will be a project change request. So these three examples that I gave you, those are project change requests from a scope. The scope means that we will be not, will not be using Dell computers, we'll be using IBM computers as an example of scope. Uh, 
Uh, we will need six more months. That's an example of a change request for schedule. We will need $2 million more. That is a respect a change request for uh, cost for money for, uh, for budget. So, these, so for the change request, you used to write it yourself and then you to, so these are some of the examples of uh, some of the artifacts that you used to create. Um, I think that is uh, enough for now. So one, one of the most, two things that I remember from your interview, because I think she mentioned about yep. implementation and migration. So yep. for the Windows 10 project, one of the things was migration and implementation is almost the same thing in that project, in fact. So migration yep. is when you're doing a like an assembly line, like a cookie cutter, every day you are you start to migrate five, six hundred, seven hundred or a thousand people every day, and you just start that just goes on like an automatic process every just like a an assembly on an assembly plant yep. cars are produced similarly during the migration process. Uh, every day you are cutting over or you are migrating one thousand users and if you have to convert 100,000 users, then over a 100-day period, you will migrate all those 100 users, 100,000 users to the new Windows 10. So that migration is basically part of which you are implementing the project at that time. Okay? Thank you. So migration and implementation in this example are almost the same thing. Uh, you. In your case, Rimsha, there was a uh, slip off my mind. Um, I, I, I forgot. I just remembered and then I forgot. But anyway, if I remember, I'll, 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 I'll tell you tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. right. okay, Was so, it regarding the Windows 10 project too? Uh, just a sec. Just give me a sec. Let me just try to remember. Um, Would they ask us? Uh, yeah, just, just, just a sec. I yeah. almost remembered again, man. I, <laughs> uh, I just remember the game that's off. Um, I guess I'll remember again. Uh, maybe by so anyways. Um so I think that is all so next steps are just digest all this information that I said uh, during uh, this last one hour. Uh, and maybe you will need to uh, you will need to just practice as to how do you say that in during the interview, okay? Um, okay. Like like the sequencing of what needs to be said first, what needs to be said later. And tomorrow we'll do a mock interview, and then maybe I'll give okay. you very very high level uh, idea about the data center migration. Uh, I mean the project that you have. Uh, luckily, that is a data migration project, in fact. So uh, the, the Windows 10 project, that is a data migration project. So, uh, okay. so, so I think you, you are, uh, even if you have your interview tomorrow morning, uh, I think you, if you answer these questions, morning, the way yeah. that, uh, yeah, then, then, then you, 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 are, you should be good enough. Okay, My only okay. concern is, one thing it's the fact that I'll have some of the same answers as November is that that's like my only nerve like what if she like picks up uh, her the girl who's um, interviewing us her name is um, Janelle like what if she you know, picks on the fact that oh how come she has the same answer as the, the first guy that I interviewed you know and that's my only concern so how far are your interviews apart like are they back-to-back -back or no, his is at 10, mine is at 12.30. Mine is at 9, 9. And they're 45 minutes long. Oh, yours is 9? Okay, my bad. Yeah. Okay, so three, four hours, I... Three, four hours are... Uh, and there are, you're saying there are only two people there interviewing. From, from, from I don't know for sure, but... So yeah, there's multiple, the multiple people from different recruitment companies, but from ISG, it's us, us two. Okay, so that's not a problem then. Okay, so because this is what's going to happen from ISG, they are going to interview the number at nine o'clock, and then on at nine forty-five, they may be interviewing another candidate from uh, Robert Huff, and at ten 
30, they may be interviewing another person from PROCOM and so on. So by the time uh, I think your turn comes, then uh, they would have already interviewed four or five different people in between. So they wouldn't remember uh, okay. all the answers. Like the, these are the answers. I mean, you know, if I pick any PCO, yeah. they will pretty much give the same answers. If okay. These are the activities that I do instead of reporting. Yes, it's yeah. scheduling. That's, that's what I do. That's what the work is. Um, yeah. If I ask a doctor, what do you do? You'll say, I, I, I check the temperature of the patient. I, mm -hmm. I check his eyes. I check his ears. I take his pulse. That's what I do. If another doctor is saying mm -hmm. the same thing, it does not mean that uh, they are partners in crime or something, but uh, that, that's my job is. That's what I do for a living. Now, I create a set of supports. Uh, so, uh, so I think that that should not be an issue. I mean, it would have been a little bit of issue if both of you were like back to back, absolutely. Yeah. Then, but then in between there will be three, four uh, other candidates, so that should be fine. And after four hours, uh, they would not even remember. Um, so that is fine. And I think what is happening is. They are all of a sudden, they have this rush request to find a PCO. They are probably interviewing maybe 10 people tomorrow. Uh, and uh, from there, they will pick two or three people for the next round, and that will be, and then they will pick one. So right. let's see. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, as much as you are nervous, I can totally understand because this is your first interview. Honestly, Absolutely. go there. We yeah, are go there with confidence, and uh, really, you. I think it's. I usually take the first two, three interviews as more like the practice. Round. Yeah, just going uh, to it as like knowing you're not even gonna get in. So just like a practice. Um, it's, it's, where you yeah, that at way. This point. I mean, and who knows? You 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 may even get it. I mean, you know, like I would say, yeah. the quality of your interview yesterday was eight out of ten. And eight of, out of ten is usually good enough to land on an interview, or land on a job offer. Mm -hmm. So who knows? You may even get it. But even if you really do not, if none of you get it, really, I mean, I will be more surprised if you get it rather than if you don't get it. I mean, you know, the, like usually the first interview that you go to, uh, it's, uh, it's, it, I think. But the good thing is, uh, it is, it's just accelerating the whole process. Uh, what otherwise we would have probably been doing all this exercise over what we just did during the last couple of days. We would have probably taken yep. two, three weeks to do this. Now the I entire see. process is accelerated, and yep. um, you can probably you can you can start going to you, you, so this is this accelerated everything. So it's it's yep. good. Um, so even if you don't get the but I'm not saying, I mean, you know, like you, I, I say you may as well get uh, the offer, but uh, even if you don't, not a big deal. Not a okay. big deal at all. Okay. And also, so, um, for, for, for clarity and scheduling and all that stuff, will we need to do an overview of the software and everything? Or they, they might not even ask? No, no. They cannot, they will not ask, they cannot ask you in a 45 minutes interview. Uh, give you a Microsoft project and tell you to create the schedule. Like, I mean, they cannot give you a hands-on uh, this demonstration of uh, your skills for using Microsoft project and clarity. So don't worry about it. Whatever okay. you say, they will take your word on it. They will okay. have to take your word on it. Have there to. are some other technical interviews where they put you in front of a machine and ask you to create something. That's not happening tomorrow. That's okay. not happening in, in project management interviews. That is not happening. Yeah, and with the urgency they have, they, they need, they're not even going to do that, I think, because the reason is um, they said their uh, go live date is November. With their, their anticipated go live date is November, which is probably not going to happen. The guy who was sitting with me at ISU was laughing. He's like, I don't think it's going to happen. But don't yeah. say that in the interview. I said, no, I won't bring it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... Okay. All right. Okay. I think this is uh, a lot of information, so it will take you time to digest it. Uh, I will see if I have uh, a uh, if you have recorded it. Fine. Otherwise, I will send you a. If you can send as well, that would be great. Um, because there's different qualities to different recordings. 
Uh, also, okay. uh, Zephyr, what software do you use for recording? Because ours beeps every time we try to record. Uh, because our mine is an Android phone, and Android okay. is easy. I mean, Android does not have, and I think both of you use Apple, right? Apple, yeah, we need to download an app for that. So we're using, we're using tape call or whatever it is, and it beeps. I use ACR, but uh, with, with uh, Apple, it is always more difficult. I see. Yeah, Android is easy. Apple is more difficult because Apple sure. is higher on security. It's the good thing, but when it comes to recording conversations, I, I think see. Apple. I so we'll have to live with the beep. I, Sorry, so probably it could be uh, that beep. Probably, yeah, maybe that beep will probably be there. Maybe, maybe if you go to the settings, you may find out. I like the one that I use doesn't beep or anything. Uh, gotcha. Yeah, but that is more like an Android one. Maybe you, if you look, I'll, I'll take a screenshot of what's the exact name of this uh, app, and I'll send it to you. Okay. Okay, sounds good. And also, um, so based on everything, um, and also the message I sent you, like the the, the, the guy from ISG, he said, um, look at Prep, look at Hybrid, look at um, uh, um, all those other names that I mentioned to you, is it worth even looking into? Because I think hybrid was something that I was thinking of looking into just for the interview's sake. Hybrid, like, was he talking about hybrid from an agile waterfall perspective or hybrid what? Sorry. Hybrid in, hybrid in terms of the um, uh, migrate, uh, in terms of the data center perspective, he said hybrid data center uh, and uh, also a prem data center kind of like implementation. I think he was talking about different implementation uh, methodologies and kind of like how they implement a data center. I think he was talking about that. So he said to look at hybrid, maybe just in case if it comes up. Uh, I do not. No, so I spoke to one of my friends who's a project manager, the technical yep. project manager. He does the data center migration project. And he said data center, Migration is like an ocean. There are so many technicalities and so many different things that could be done, and so, so many different types of things which are called by the center migration. Uh, yeah. So I think we just need to. Uh, I mean, it, it's uh, to, we just need to know it from a hundred thousand feet high level. We cannot. You cannot go into the details, details because. A lot of those technical details you are not even supposed to know. Okay, so we can leave uh, it out. No, no worries. I mean, it's just a, a thought. A thought I would consider mentioning it because he did mention it, but I don't think it would need to be com coming up because it's not mentioned in the job details. No, he told me that you don't need. They don't expect you to know it, but if you do know anything about data centers, then that's like they'll consider you more, like more than. Yeah, the other they said that to Rimsha. They didn't even say that to me. They said that to Rimsha. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so you, you, so both of you had a call with ISG today, or no? We had a meeting with ISG today. We were both went downtown early, and we had oh, met really? with them yeah. one okay. by one. Yeah. Okay. How was their office and stuff? With the ISG, I've never dealt with before. I'm mean, guessing yeah, new there, name. There, there's a very, a very empty office, but on a very big floor. They're on on an old, very old office building right in front of Eden Center. Um, so they, but they had, uh, they had their logos inside the office and everything. Yeah, it was okay. nice. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. So uh, don't don't worry about it. I mean, you know, like, okay. uh, um, yeah. So that's exactly what happens is for project control officers. It is nice if you have some data center experience uh, because then it's easy. But you, the Windows 10 migration project is, is a good is a good example because it already talks about some of the, those data center related activities, those data migration activities, and Azure. All so right. that that's a perfect. I mean, that's a and I think that could be probably one of the reasons why, now one of the reasons why your interviews, uh, sorry, why your resume got picked up is because you, because of those mentions of Azure and data center migration on your resume. Uh, Possibly, that's how yeah. the shortlisting takes place. Okay. I see. And so that's how our way of cheating the system, even if you have not done it, just mention it on your resume and then later on just make a few phone calls and watch a few YouTube videos, and then that's how it is usually done. Gotcha. Okay, uh, I'm running late, so gotcha. we'll find a time tomorrow, sure. Thank and you. then we'll, we'll do some, some more questions on it, okay? All right, perfect, thank you. All right, cool. Bye. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.